Hi, I'm Devron Kariba. I'm Vanessa Kariba. And today we are reading from the NIV UK version of the Bible, John chapter 4, verse 1 through to 26. Now Jesus learns that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who, is, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship that you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet the time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just like to pray in for today's word. Father, we just pray, Lord, that as you prepare our hearts and our minds and our spirits, Lord, that we can leave everything that's come about from the days before in the week and we can be ready to receive your word. Let it be fruitful from the mouth that delivers the word. And let it be fruitful or land in our hearts, Lord, like seeds on fertile ground. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Devron and Vanessa, for doing that reading. Uh, Devron and Vanessa live just a few streets away from here. And it's amazing. Uh, it, it made me realise in the worship time, I was just standing at the back, uh, realising how much I've missed being able to gather together as God's people. And it feels really significant today as we were talking about Easter Sunday last week and resurrection, that now the church is being reborn as we begin to regather. Um, it, it, I know that everyone's all at a different uh, stages in terms of confidence, whether they uh, want to meet with people, whether they're able to meet with people or not over this season. We want to assure you that the live stream is going to continue, is going to be our main focus for teaching and worship on a Sunday morning. So we're not going to stop that. We're going to be doing that now forever, but we're going to be putting a lot of energy and effort 
into it over the coming weeks. Uh, but also as we go, we're going to begin adding the new gatherings, as Stuart was saying. The way to book into the gatherings, you can do it through the emails that we're sending out. Can you double check on your spam? Recently, all of my restore emails have been going to my spam, so I've had to retrieve them all. So if you want to know how to book in, book in via the emails, check through your emails. If we haven't got your email address yet, then register on the Restore website. Uh, give us your details. We'll make sure you get involved to those. Keep an eye on the app as well, because we're working towards being able to book into the live streams from the app. So today, as Stuart was saying, we're starting our brand new series that we're called, calling Living Water. And it's a seven-week series. It actually runs from now right the way through to Pentecost, would you believe, 23rd of May, Pentecost Sunday, the Sunday that we celebrate the giving of the Holy Spirit. But we don't have to wait seven weeks until we receive God's Holy Spirit. Actually, we can receive and live in the power of God's Spirit, even right now. And over this series, we're going to be looking in particular at the story of the woman at the well that Devron and Vanessa uh, read so well to us. A well-known story from John chapter 4 that is all about the work of the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that I've uh, really had a sense of over the last couple of weeks, I feel like as we start moving out of lockdown, I know it's been a, a hard season and a heavy season, I think probably for us all, probably most of us, if we're honest, we're feeling quite weary and exhausted and uh, quite worn down. But I have a real sense that the Lord is just wanting to renew us and refresh us in his spirit. And so one of the reasons we want to take these seven weeks to look at uh, the living water of God, the life-giving presence of God, is that we as a church may uh, begin to invite that Holy Spirit to come and renew us and refresh us. And also the second sense I've got is that we're going to be quite surprised by some of the outbreaks of the Spirit of God, some of the situations we're going to find ourselves in. We're going to suddenly end up in a conversation and think, wow, God's here. And we're going to end up in a different position and God's going to speak to us uh, significantly as we're out and about in the community. And so I've just really got that sense that over this season, God's wanting to renew us and refresh us in his spirit. But also we're going to be surprised with some of the outbreaks of the Spirit of God that we see over this season. Now, if you tuned in a few weeks ago, we had a Vision Sunday where we were updating on our Restore vision. And uh, we said that we've uh, come to sum up the whole of our vision as Restore with one sentence. We know that the mandate for Restore comes from Isaiah 61, which uh, Jesus used as his mandate in Luke chapter 4. But if we wanted to sum up everything that Restore is all about in one sentence, then we reckon you can sum it up in this, which is that we welcome everyone to walk with Jesus every day and see restoration everywhere. I'm going to say it twice, just so you uh, remember it and get it lodged into your heart and your spirit. But as a church, we welcome everyone to walk with Jesus every day and to see restoration everywhere. And the wonderful thing about the story of the woman at the well in John chapter 4 is it's a wonderful representation of that very sentence. Because the three words that are key for us in that sentence are everyone, every day, everywhere. And when we think about the story of the woman at the well in John 4, we find exactly those three things being prioritised. Uh, number one, it is a really unlikely encounter. In the time of Jesus, the Jews didn't mix with the, Gentile, with the Samaritans. And so remember the story of the Good Samaritan. He uses, Jesus uses that story to shock people that a Samaritan should care for a Jew. So they were kind of uh, enemies or uh, people that there was a lot of hostility between the Jews and the Samaritans. And uh, women were not uh, regarded as first class citizens in the time of Jesus either. And particularly women with questionable reputations. And yet... Jesus interacts with this woman and as he interacts with this woman, so he breaks down every single barrier. And as a church, we know that God has called us in the power of the Holy Spirit to be a church that break down every barrier, whether that's barriers of racism, whether it's barriers of sexism, whether it's barriers of sexuality. We know that God has called us to break them all down so that everyone can know they are uniquely and passionately loved by God and that everyone is welcome into the presence of God. And none of us have got it all together. I've been journeying with Jesus now for over 30 years. There's still areas of my life that Jesus 
Jesus is still working on. I still need an unconditional welcome. And as a church, we want to be a church that genuinely welcomes everyone. Jesus got criticised for who we would have uh, to his parties, who we'd have meals with. I want to be the kind of church that we get criticised for who we welcome and the way that we passionately love because we so carry God's heart and God's heart is for everyone. And in this story, the most unlikely lady, it walks into the power of the love of God in Jesus and experiences a life transformation. And as a church, we're all about everyone. Everyone is welcome. There's a, there's a book that I read a few years ago, a guy called John Burke, and he had a motto for his church, and he called it, No Perfect People Allowed. And I love it because the reality is there are no per perfect people. Jesus was the only perfect one. But Jesus wasn't frightened to mix with the kind of people that would tarnish his reputation because he wanted them to encounter the goodness and the love of God. So as a church, we welcome everyone to walk with Jesus every day. What I also love about the story of the woman at the well is it was a very normal everyday occurrence. So Jesus was weary from his journey. He stops and he needs something to drink. His disciples go off and get some food. He's sitting there and this woman comes and does the same thing as she would have done every single day. She comes to draw water. But it's in the ordinary grounded everyday life that Jesus is able to speak into her heart and see a life transformed. And as a church, we're not all about the Sundays. Sundays are significant. It's great to be able to worship together in person. It's great to be able to be in the same space. It's great to be able to listen to the voice of God. It's great to be encouraged by stories of what God is doing. But we're not all about the Sundays. The Sundays fill us up so the rest of our week we can walk with Jesus and carry the presence of Jesus. And it's an ordinary, everyday instance that God moves and somebody's life is changed. And we want to be the kind of church that, that on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, see, I can even remember the days of the week. And I'm doing well at the end of lockdown to be able to do that. I, sometimes I can even differentiate between the different days as well. Sometimes, <laughs> not always. But even in the mundane, everyday things, maybe going to the supermarket, Maybe when the Amazon delivery man rings your doorbell yet again. In those moments, we want to be open to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and to be ready to see God work through us and bring his life-giving water so it touches other people. Because we welcome everyone to walk with Jesus every day and to see restoration everywhere. And what's also wonderful about the story, we didn't read the whole story, but you will get it over the next few weeks because we're going to take uh, bit by bit different aspects of the story and look at them week by week as we go through this series. But at the end of the story, this woman goes back to her village and she goes back to her village and she says to the people, she says, come and meet a man who told me everything about my life. And then it goes on and the whole village then journey to meet with Jesus. In fact, she's the, the first kind of evangelist or missionary sent out by Jesus, and she brings the whole of her community to meet with Jesus. Now, isn't that incredible? And that's the kind of transformation that happens when we welcome the work of God's Spirit. And we welcome everyone to walk with Jesus every day and see restoration everywhere. And if there's one thing I would love to see reproduced over the life of Restore over this next season, it's lots and lots and lots of woman at the well encounters where we're led by the Holy Spirit and real transformation, real life change, real community change happens because we're open and available to God's Holy Spirit. Now you will have noticed that the story of the woman of the well happens in John's Gospel. If you know your Gospels very well, um, you'll know that Matthew, Mark and Luke are known as the synoptic Gospels. And so many of the commentators will tell you that they look in a very logical way through the life of Jesus and record the major events and circumstances. So in many ways, they tell us what Jesus did and how he went about his everyday life. John's Gospel is a bit different to that. It doesn't take uh, such a, a, a straightforward look at it, but it looks more at the spiritual truths in the life of Jesus. So where the other Gospels kind of tell us what Jesus did, uh, John's focus is much more who Jesus was. 
And so he only records seven miracles, starting with the turning of the water into wine, uh, finishing with the raising of Lazarus from the dead. But they're all miracles that tell us something about who Jesus was. And in John's Gospel as well, we get the seven I am statements, like I am the good shepherd, I am the way, the truth, the life, I am the bread of life. So we get the I am statements. Again, they're revealing the identity of Jesus. But one of the themes that weaves its way right the way through John's Gospel is the theme of the working of the Spirit of God. And uh, in this season, we don't want to be trying to conjure up anything or manufacture anything. We want to be leaning rather into the Holy Spirit and letting his life-giving, his living water flow again over us, but flow through us to impact the world around us. And if we look at some of the references to the Spirit of God in John's Gospel, we find these. So John the Baptist Um, in uh, John chapter 1 verse 32 says I have seen the spirit descending as a dove out of heaven and he remained upon him upon Jesus I've seen the spirit descending as a dove out of heaven and he remained upon him and actually the longer uh, the full passage there uh, John was told by God the way that he would know who Jesus was is he would see the Holy Spirit remaining on him and resting on him. And Jesus' life was so fruitful because he walked in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus got baptised by John the Baptist, then we know the story well probably, but heaven was opened. The Holy Spirit came down like a dove and rested on him. And a voice spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Do you know the same Spirit of God is available to you right now that's what we celebrate at Pentecost but we celebrate that every day since that God's spirit is resting on us and in the same way that Jesus's life was marked out by the power of the spirit resting on him God wants our lives to be marked out by the power of the spirit of God just where you are now uh, as you're listening to this do you know you can be welcoming the dove of God's spirit to come and rest afresh on you so that you may know God's spirit, God's love afresh with you, flowing over, bringing healing, bringing restoration, but also bringing equipping and empowering so that you can walk with Jesus every day and see restoration everywhere by the power of the spirit. In John chapter 3, uh, Jesus has an encounter with Nicodemus, one of the religious leaders of the day. And he first talks to Nicodemus about the need to be born again. But in the encounter with Nicodemus, he says this, he says, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes from, and you don't know where it's going. So is everyone who's born of the Spirit. And one of the things I see when I read through the gospel accounts of Jesus' story, I see that sense of Jesus every day just being open and available to the Holy Spirit. And in certain moments, it's like the Holy Spirit just nudges him and says, talk to her or stop right now. And one of the practices that I want to train myself into being more and more and more is less diary-led and more spirit-led. And so I may have my plan and my structure for my day, and I love plan and structure. Uh, talk, talk to my wife, Chris, I love a routine. But one of the challenges for routine-based people is so easily we can get on with our routine and miss the Holy Spirit moments. And over this season, I want to be available to the Holy Spirit so that as the wind blows where it does, suddenly I can have a prompt, talk to that person. Or stop a little bit longer where you are. And I can make myself every day available. And you get that sense with Jesus that he knew what he was called to. He knew his destination. He knew the places that he needed to be at particular times. But along the way, he was very open with the journey. And very open and available and listening for the prompting of the Holy Spirit. I want to encourage you over this season. Why don't we um, make ourselves more available? And each day when we get up. Why don't you get up in the morning and say, Holy Spirit, fill me afresh. Holy Spirit, lead me through this day. And at particular moments during the day, why not just take a few moments and say, Holy Spirit, is there someone now that you want me to ring? Or WhatsApp? 
Or is there someone, as I go to the shops, is there someone, Lord, that you particularly want me to sit and talk to? Is there someone that you've got a word uh, that you want me to speak into their life? But let's make one of the hallmarks of this next season a real availability to the work of the Spirit. And then when we get to the second half of John's Gospel, and Jesus is preparing the disciples for when he won't be with them anymore. Again, he talks a lot about the availability of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit is going to come to be their helper. So in John chapter 16, it says this. He says, but I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away. If I do not go away, the helper, the Greek word there is parakletos, the one who comes alongside as our advocate, as our helpmate, uh, <coughs> If I go away, the helper, if I don't go away, the helper shall not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And again in John chapter 14, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do. And greater works than these he will do. Why? Because I go to the Father. When I go to the Father, the Spirit will come. And then there'll be a whole army of people, a whole company of people who know the life of the Spirit, living in them and through them to bring change and transformation around. And so Jesus says, you're not going to be left on your own. In fact, he says, you're not going to be left as orphans. You're not going to be left on your own. Actually, I'm going to send my spirit to be with you, which is why every single day we can know the spirit of God is with us. He's working with us. He's resourcing us. He's leading us. He's helping us. He's taking us forward. And so again, right the way through John's Gospel, we get this pattern of the Holy Spirit being at work through Jesus and Jesus continually being surrendered and being available to the Holy Spirit. So much everything that we want to be as a church so we can know that living water in us, but also that living water flowing out of us to other people. And Jesus has then, in the middle of that, he has this encounter with this woman in John chapter 4. And uh, it's interesting because he talks um, in it about life-giving water. And uh, if, we, if you know anything about the history of the place that it happens, the encounter happens at a place called Sychar. If we can bring up the map of it. Uh, it's just there. Uh, that'll explain where it is on, on, the, on the right of your uh, screen. The grey area is the Sea of Galilee. And so uh, in Samaria, you find uh, Sychar and Jacob's well. And it says this at the very start of the story. It says, so he, Jesus, came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. Now, that word that's used for well wasn't actually the normal word that you would use for well. Literally, it means spring. Jacob's spring was there. And actually, the, the town of Sychar, it was um, at a place that was the water summit for the region, which means that after the rainy season, uh, the water table would, would rise up in Sychar and there would be springs of water that would spring up all over the place. And those springs of water would then fertilise all the valleys around. And uh, people used to say that Sychar was one of the most beautiful places that you could visit in the spring and in the summer because it was so full of life. And it's because it was a naturally uh, a a fertile area where springs of water regularly sprung up. So it's not surprising that in that context, Jesus, when he talks to the woman, talks about the life of the Spirit springing up because she would have been used to the local area, experiencing springs and outbreaks that would bring fertility. And so what he was saying to her was he was saying, the life of my Spirit is going to come and do exactly the same thing. Do you know, one of the things I love about Jesus is that he used everyday language into... Uh, things that people knew are part of everyday circumstances to then bring spiritual truths out of. So it wasn't like he had his, his, his preach in his back pocket and then when he got the opportunity, he gave out his preach. He was actually aware of his environment and he would just take some things that people knew well from their environment but find a way of connecting with people. And so Sychar was a, was a naturally fertile place that was used to experiencing springs of water that are bursting up. But secondly, it was also a place that had a deep spiritual heritage. It was a place where Jacob found water 
and uh, used that water to uh, nourish his family. And then he gave uh, the well onto his son Joseph. And wells were really significant, obviously, in, a, in uh, the Middle East, uh, where a lot of the ground is desert. Then, then watering holes become really significant. So it was a really significant place. Now, when I was praying about this passage and praying about this season, I just felt that God was saying those two things that are really significant. Number one, there's going to be like springs of the Spirit that we're going to see just burst into form into life over this next season and we will be surprised by some of them so don't be surprised if this week when you drop the kids back at school or this week when you go to the supermarket or this week when you're on a zoom call with one of your work friends if suddenly you walk into something of the spirit of God because I believe there's going to be little outbursts of the spirit of God that's going to happen all over the place so be prepared for them be ready for them the second thing that I really sense over this season is there's going to be some words that God's given us historically or some things that God's spoken to us historically but in this season we're going to start to see them fulfilled so as you come out of lockdown as you think what is life going to look like in this next season can I encourage you have an eye on the things that God has spoken to you in the past have an eye of this on the things that you've longed for and been praying for and that maybe God's promised you in years gone by. Have an eye on those things because I think we're going to see some of them start to be fulfilled. And uh, just in terms of my own experience, the last month or so has been uh, really hard um, on lots of of levels. Um, Sometimes in uh, church leadership, um, you have to make calls um, that are really tricky. Um, I I think sometimes people watch and think it's easy. Um, It's never quite so easy when you're in the place where you have to make some of those decisions. Um, And when you really love people um, and you're a church that is all about loving and honouring people, but also you have a responsibility of doing what's right in the presence of God, actually blending those two things can be really tough. Um, and nobody makes hard calls easily and uh, nobody that I've ever experienced in leadership makes them without sleepless nights and lots of tears. Um, It can be a really lonely place, it can be a really tough place and uh, we've been through a season at the end of lockdown that we've had to make some really tough decisions and uh, I believe we've made the right decisions for the right reasons Um, but it's cost and it's been hard What's been really interesting, though, is exactly at the same time that we've had to make some really tough, hard decisions and some decisions that in lots of ways we would have rather not made. At the same time, God's done some really beautiful things as well. And Stuart was sharing about uh, our gift day and the £50,000. Do you know, when we started that week, I thought, we're never going to see that money come. This is, this, is, this is spirit-filled leadership, isn't it, in action? <laughs> I thought, we're never going to see this money come because all the natural things are saying this is the wrong time to make this ask. But we don't deal in the natural. We don't deal in the economy of men. We deal in the economy of God. And you know, the money came. And I want to thank you for everyone that has given, everyone who has been a part of that. But even more than that, I'm grateful to God because ultimately he is our provider. And when all the natural signs would have said, this is a stupid time to do this, this is a stupid time you not see it happen, actually God came through. And over this last week, there's something that I've carried in my heart in terms of future of Restore and some of our next steps that I haven't quite seemed to fall into place And yet this last week, it feels like it's falling into place and God is on the move. And, you know, you can have these moments that you feel empty and worthless and that you're really struggling. And yet in those very moments, the presence of God, the life giving water of God starts to break out. And I really believe in this next season as a church, we all of us will probably be feeling a little bit like uh, like we're weary like we're carrying maybe pains and griefs from this last season. But I really believe God's going to surprise us with some of the ways that we see the outbreaks of the Spirit of God. And so just be ready for that. And I love the fact, you see, in in, uh, Corinthians, uh, Paul writes that God's chosen the uh, foolish things of the world to, to, to shame the wise. 
And I think in lots of ways, it is the unexpected that is so encouraging because then we know it's God and it's not us. And God overtakes us with his grace. God overtakes us with the wonder of his love. God overtakes us with the work of the Spirit. So right now, you might feel the least prepared you've ever felt to carry the love of Jesus to someone else. Do you know that doesn't matter to God? And in lots of ways, that's the best place to be because you can't do it, which means you have to lean into God and he can do it in and through you. And in the middle of this story, I'm not going to go a, a lot uh, longer this morning, but in the middle of this story, Jesus has this conversation with this lady and he talks about life-giving water springing up. In verses 13 and 14, he says, everyone who drinks of this water, the natural water that they were drawing from the well, shall thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall become in him a well. And again, literal translation is a spring of water springing up to eternal life. And no wonder when Jesus says this to this lady, her heart's response is, give me that water. Give me that water. I want the deepest thirst, the deepest longing of my soul. I want that to be fulfilled. I want that life-giving water to spring up uh, at the very depths, from the very depths of who I am. And Jesus invites this woman to it, but he invites us all to it. And if you know John's gospel very well, it'll remind you what happens just a couple of chapters later in John chapter 7, verses 37 to 38. And uh, this time Jesus is, is at a feast in Jerusalem. And it's the Feast of the Tabernacles. And uh, it's a seven-day festival, so lots of celebrating around that. But on the seventh day, they would have a ceremony and they would take some water from the Pool of Siloam and they would process it through the streets of Jerusalem and they would bring it to the temple and they would bring it to the altar. And in a great celebration on the last and the greatest day of the feast, they would pour this water out on, on the altar as a sign of life-giving water being poured from heaven. And in John chapter 7, verses 37 to 38, John records and he says, Now on the last day, the greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. And you know that verse? is true for today, that if we come to Jesus right here, right now, he will loose springs, rivers of life-giving water that will change us, but also change the world through us. And that, that verse for me is a particularly special one, because uh, in 1994, I'm getting older now, it's what, 27 years ago, looking at Fran as if she's going to give me the answer. And she was <laughs> silent in, in my moment of need. She was silent. But anyway, I'll try David next time. Um, in 1994, there was an outbreak of the Spirit of God in Toronto that brought about huge change uh, worldwide, brought about huge personal change to me. Um, and as a part of that outpouring of the Spirit of God, one of my friends paid for me to go to Toronto and to spend some time in the church there. And so uh, that's what I did. And every evening they had meetings where you could just worship Jesus and invite the Holy Spirit to come. Some of the mornings they had meetings where you could just worship Jesus and invite the Holy Spirit to come. Some days, though, we had some free time. And uh, one day when we had free time, we thought, well, what are the sites that you can go and see in Toronto? And uh, one of the sites is Niagara Falls, because it's not a long way away from it. And so we went to Niagara Falls, and uh, we went on the Maid of the Mist. And uh, the Maid of the Mist is the boat there, uh, pictured on your screen. And you can go on that boat right into the bottom of the Horseshoe Falls there. And as we drove on the top of the boat with my uh, silly uh, uh, little plastic raincoat on and rain hat that you get free of charge when you've paid your fee. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm, I'm bigging it up for you all. But we went on the top of the boat and we went right to the foot of Horseshoe Falls. And when I was standing there on the top of the boat, everywhere that I saw around me was cascading water, more powerful than I've ever seen water falling and wherever I went I was surrounded by that water 
And as I was standing there looking at the water, getting soaked by it, I was reminded of that verse where Jesus says, from your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. And uh, me being me, got caught up in the moment. I've no idea what people were doing around me. But I was standing there saying, God, that's the river I want. God, that's the river I want. And my, my understanding of what a life-giving river could look like changed in that moment. And I don't know what your impression of a life-giving river is like. It doesn't have to be a little trickle. It doesn't have to be a little brook. It can be Niagara Falls. And for me, it just expanded my capacity of what God wants to do in and through me when we open ourselves to his spirit. Today we're kicking off this series. We're going to, as I say, be looking at it over the next seven weeks. But why don't we have a moment today where we just surrender ourselves afresh to the Spirit of God and invite that living water just to flow again over us. So wherever you are right now, why don't you just put down your device, put down your Bible, take a moment just to sit. And as we sit together, let's invite a spring of God's living water just to start to flow right now in your home, in your heart, in your spirit, in your life. Thank you, Jesus, that you promised to this lady who in lots of ways was the least likely person in some of the least likely circumstances, but you promised because she was with you that you would release in her life-giving water. And Father, I pray right now, you will release life-giving water right the way across Restore. Father, I pray for every individual listening in. Father, I pray for every home, Lord. Pray over every family, Lord. I pray over our local communities. Father, let your living water start to flow. Say, spring up, oh well, spring up, oh well, spring up, oh well, spring up, oh well. Father, I pray for those of us that are really weary. I pray for those of us that feel like we're empty. Father, let your living water start to flow right now. Will you come and fill right now? Will you come and fill, Father? I pray for some of us it'll be like just standing under the shower, this, that uh, right now we'll be standing under a shower of the Spirit of God. Lord, will you bring refreshment, Lord? Will you bring restoration, Lord? Will you bring healing, Lord? May your life-giving water start to flow. And Father, we want to take these moments just to bathe, just to soak in the river of your Spirit. We welcome you, Holy 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 Spirit. And just now, as the Spirit is starting to uh, flow, uh, just uh, enlarge your capacity, enlarge your vision for what can be. Just like I had my vision enlarged at the foot of Niagara Falls. Enlarge your vision. Maybe if you're just feeling a little touch of the Holy Spirit, invite God to multiply that. Invite God to increase it. Invite God to accelerate it. Ask God for more and more and more and more and more and more and more. Lord, we're hungry for you, Lord Jesus. We're desperate for you, Lord. Like a dry and a thirsty land, Lord, we cry out for more of your Spirit, more of your Spirit more of your spirit and father we cry out for us lord we cry out for us father but we cry out for our community we cry out for our nation we pray father let the wind of let the rain of your spirit let the wind of your spirit let the rain of your spirit let the wind start to blow let the rain start to fall across this nation in jesus name in jesus name in jesus name We invite you, we welcome you, we celebrate you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you, we welcome you, we welcome you. Let's keep drinking in the Spirit of God. Let's keep drinking in, let's keep soaking. You know, uh, dry ground, it needs to be soaked, it needs to be drenched in the Spirit of God. Let's drench, let's soak. And I want to encourage you every day, uh, when you get up in the morning, find some time, maybe put on some worship, but soak yourself afresh in the Spirit of God. Soak yourself afresh. Let's get drenched in the Spirit of God, in the presence of God, in the life of Jesus. Get drenched in this season.